Bienvenido. On behalf of Columbia University and its Institute on Latin American Studies and the Cuba program, I want to welcome all of you to a very exciting program today on academic, cultural, and sports exchanges between Cuba and the United States, which have historically been going on uh, very successfully from at least the 19th century and increasingly beginning in the 1920s. This is a prelude to an arts festival that we are planning in 19, not, I'm still in the 19th century. Um, 2022? 2022, yes. And hopefully we will have some of the same people here uh, who will be presenting in that. But now I'm going to turn over this evening's webinar to Harold Cardenas from Nuestra America. Harold. Thanks, Mac. Thanks, Mac. Uh, greetings to all. Thank you for joining us in, in this panel on the future of academic, cultural, and sports exchanges between Cuba and the US. My name is Harold Cardenas, and today I will be your moderator. This event is sponsored by the Cuba program and the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University in collaboration with Nuestra America Initiative. Our speakers today have first-hand experience and have shaped the exchanges between both countries. For me, it's a privilege to introduce Gabriel Vignoli, Assistant Professor for, of International Affairs at the New School and a recipient of the New School's 2019 Distinguished University Teaching Award his current research on Q is on Cuba's informal, illegal, and illegal economies. Gabriel is a faculty coordinator of the Cuba International Field Program. This is a nine-week international research and practice program that is held every summer in collaboration with Casa de las Americas in Havana, Cuba. He is also the faculty coordinator of the Havana Studio, a course on the preservation of Havana's urban heritage with a one-week workshop in Havana with Casa de las Americas, Cujay, and Havana's Office of the City Historian. We also have Liz Alfonso. Liz is a choreographer, dancer, professor, and director of her internationally celebrated dance company. Due to her great social work through her dance school and constant dedication to educate children and young people in the best and artistic human values, she was appointed Google Ambassador for UNICEF in Cuba in 2011. In 2015, Liz became the Liz Dance Company became the first from Cuba to perform at the Latin Grammy Awards ceremony in Las Vegas. In 2016, the Liz Alfonso Dance Cuba Company was chosen to entertain at the White House and Michelle Obama awarded Liz with the International Spoiler Award for the USA's President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. That is a very large <laughs> award, <laughs> name for an award. Yeah. <laughs> we, we also have Tommy Goodman, the former executive director of the Caribbean Educational and Baseball Foundation, a nonprofit organization that, that using a shared passion for baseball, build bridges between the US, Cuba, and other neighbors in the Caribbean. After over 2,000 trips to Cuba in support of CEVF's efforts, Tommy developed a keen sense for the importance and impact of sports and cultural diplomacy, and how baseball in particular can serve as a key to improve relations between the US and Cuba and to help the people of both countries. Previously serving, practicing as an attorney and serving as associate vice president at the international consulting firm, The Coin Group in Washington, DC, Tommy currently leads Latin American strategy at the law firm of Allen and Overy, but maintains a close watch of developments within the sports diplomacy space. First, we're gonna do a little housekeeping before we start with the panelists. We will have one hour of dialogue with the panelists. After that, there will be time for questions and comments that you can write on our chat box. We will start with Gabriel, then we're gonna go with List, and finally with Tommy. Today we won't have a presentation, but we will have a conversation in this webinar. And I would like to start with Gabriel right now. Um, Gabriel, today we are going to put to a test the famous quote from Porfirio Diaz about being so far from God and so close to the United States. Cuba is 90 miles away from the US, we have a very large history together, and I would like to start asking you how this proximity and constant exchange between the US and Cuba shape the identity of both countries. Gabriel? 
Thank you so much, Harold. Thank you so much, Meg, for having me. And thank you so much to the Cuba program. <clears throat> I would say, of course, that history starts with geography, which in this case means proximity. The national history and identity of Cuba and the US are simply unthinkable without the other. At least since La Habana was taken by the British in 1762, the exchange has been constant. What is crucial for me is that both countries have been unique in the Americas in terms of their ability to write what I call their own political grammar, meaning by that the key words that shape a nation's identity. Think of democracy in the US or revolution in Cuba, often at a very high cost. What I think is worth highlighting is that today, history serves the present, otherwise it's what we think of as the present. Today we have four concurrent crises that are defining the present. A healthcare crisis, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, and mostly in the US, a racial crisis that are kind of an obliged opportunity to rethink the keywords that define the political grammar of the present. These keywords, to me, share one commonality. Their genealogy is often silenced and simplified in order to be more effectively transmitted towards the production of a national identity. Thus, revisiting these keywords through the lens of the other allows revisiting the roads not taking and conceiving alternative possibilities and meanings. Of course, for reasons of time, I'll only focus on one of these words, which will be race. Uh, you can think of, of course, healthcare, the economy, socialism, capitalism, democracy, and much more. Why do I choose race? Because race is unequivocally the experiential category that affects all of my students, irrespective of skin color, whenever they get to La Habana. They, we, often feel freedom, elation, enthusiasm, frustration, rejection, and embracement at the same time. Ultimately, the challenge is to read and experience one's own skin tone as someone from the US through a very different history. Whether you're black or white, if you come from the US, it will be a shock to be greeted with, how are you, mi negra or mi negro, <laughs> right? How do we get there? How can we make sense of this very different perception of race that both countries have? Of course, a very easy way to start is with uh, Haitian triangulations. Global history is unthinkable without the Haitian revolution. 1791 to 1804. Seeing defeat in Haiti in 1803, Napoleon sells Louisiana to the US and shifts its entire uh, geopolitical agenda. He moves to Europe, invades Spain and Portugal in 1807, 1808 in the Peninsular War that will lead to Latin America's independence between 1810 and 1825. At the, at the same time, sugar production, which was uh, primarily uh, centered in Saint-Domingue, it's displaced from Haiti, which had been embargoed by France, the UK, and the US, to Cuba, where sugar and slavery become the undiscussed engines of modernity and nation building. In other words, the simple fact that Saint-Domingue became Haiti, doubled the US territory through the, through the Louisiana Purchase, and boosted Cuba's sugar production, signaling the shift from naval commerce to sugar production and distribution, dramatically increasing slave imports. It also fundamentally alters the perception of the black body. It's no longer the movable object of chattel slavery, but a subject able to write its own history and enact it. It is this a perception that scares the US, which will only recognize Haiti in 1862, in the midst of the US Civil War, 58 years after independence, and Cuban sacrocracy, which fears the Haitianization of Cuba, i.e. black slaves taken over. In fact, Cuba will only opt for independence after the rest of Latin America because of the fear of the black body taken over. Slavery, of course, is at the center of the US Civil War and independentism and abolitionism in Cuba take only over only after the US Civil War. When annexation to the US slaveholding South is no longer an option. They play a crucial role in the Ten Years' War and the Little War and in Cuban Revolutionary War of 1895 to 1898. In Jose Martí's words, uh, in order to achieve self-determination and independence, the emerging Cuban nation must transcend racial inequality. In his words from Nuestra America, 
there can be no racial animosity because there are no races. Now, of course, in 1898, the explosion of USS Maine in Lavana Sport does several things. It shrinks three years of conflict into three months, the Cuban Independence War into the Spanish-American War. It sanctions the end of one empire, the Spanish one, in, and the emergence of a new empire, the American one. And it's a turning point in the articulation of the Monroe Doctrine uh, into the Roosevelt Corollary of 1904. And it sanctions the most powerful political grammar of the US, the gift of independence as something given rather than conquered, which entails a relationship of subordination that cannot be bridged. That is honed in the Spanish-American War. Cuba's official independence on May 20th, 1902 is a de jure, not de facto independence. In, in Cuba, you say, de cayó un 20 de mayo. May 20th has fallen upon you when something ha bad happens to you. That meant, along the road, that the Republican period, 1902 to 1958, in, in, embraced a deep distrust of what was a pale semblance of electoral democracy, belittled by US dependency. With regards to race in particular, the US Army intervening in Cuba came in segregated carriages. And the historical silence is what matters, what I want to emphasize is the strong presence of the black body in the pursuit of independence in Cuba and its conspicuous absence in the American Revolution. A difference that still shapes racial identity in both countries. Every Cuban knows who the Mambises were. Not many in the US know what the White Lion was. Of course, the White Lion was the first slave ship docking in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619, one year prior to the Mayflower and equally important uh, to the foundation of the nation in the US. The Cuban Revolution then occurs, and racial inequality uh, in particular becomes famously declared immoral and illegal in Fidel Castro's second declaration of La Habana of 1962, which was a direct response to Cuba's expulsion from, the, from the, the Organization of American States, a stinging critique of the Jim Crow pre-civil rights US, and a way to reinforce internal cohesion and homogeneity in the pursuit of the new man of socialism. In the US, if we are to follow progressive scholarship, Jim Crow was substituted by the war on drugs and mass incarceration. With the collapse of the USSR and the end of the, civil, uh, of the Cold War, what you have is in Cuba, the special period marked by the emergence of crisis as the new universal signifier, which initiated a new rearticulation of the political grammar of the country and the reemergence of racism, which had been dormant for 30 years. In the US, on the contrary, the New World Order entails a silencing of difference. The short-lived victory lap of the end of history by Fukuyama had probably a similar effect to what the Second Declaration of La Habana had in Cuba in 1962 with the race. It silenced the problem, which re-emerged, of course, with Obama's presidency, which brought against race to the fore. We know that in the US it reignited white fear as expressed, for example, in the very uh, important still today growth of right-wing militia groups since Obama's elections, which is being ongoing under the Trump administration. And in Cuba and in the US, the key normalization process initiated in late 2014 has uh, been a precondition for a mutual respectful interaction and for a better articulation of each country's political grammar. Why is that relevant? Because of course, racism exists in both countries, but it's experienced and framed in very different ways. And in this case, I would say that the US has quite a bit to learn from Cuba. My students and myself, of course, have the same questions that their Cuban counterparts have about race and gender inequality, money and the link between citizenship and consumption, environmental challenges, digital future, only their lenses are different. And changing the glasses through which you look at the real is the best way to make sense of it and eventually affect it. Ultimately, knowing Cuba, I firmly believe, makes US citizens better and more informed citizens of their own country. Now, the key is that both Cuba and the US are facing the same crisis in terms of reframing their own political grammar, just with very different material and conceptual tools. And this, I think, is a unique opportunity. And I'll stop here. Gabriel, could you explain us 
what is the current status of the academic exchange between the U.S. and Cuba? What are its challenges right now um, and its opportunities? No, current is a tough word to tackle because uh, academic exchange will happen even if we don't know when and how because of the election and because of COVID. Uh, globally, to me, COVID-19 is a, a key accelerator of multiple ongoing processes and following Milton Friedman's famous mantra, never let a good crisis go to waste. What is, being, what is happening in academia is that COVID-19 is an engine in change uh, that is strengthening uh, increased mediatization. Ultimately, this, is, this will lead to decreased food traffic and real estate expenses, academic digitalization, labor cost cutting, and uh, there's kind of, if you follow what's happening as we speak, Cuomo just signed to deal with uh, Google's former CEO, Schmidt, in terms of permanently integrating technology into most aspects of civil life in New York City, beginning with telehealth and remote learning. So what will that mean for the future of academia in the US? It's uh, a big unknown. And I think that's one of the main challenges that we're facing. In other words, uh, we could argue if you uh, follow Shoshana Zuboff's description of surveillance capitalism that the US is, is at the forefront of it, while Cuba in the academic sphere is very much behind, which I would argue is a good thing. In the US in particular, you have uh, political and bureaucratic challenges that are to be determined. Of course, the January runoff in Georgia will be key in terms of determining the actual strength of the, uh, of the Biden presidency. Probably uh, going back to an Obama-like moment might take up to 18 months, uh, as Cuba certainly is not a top priority. But to me, there are too many variables to factor in for an accurate prediction. Crucially, as uh, at the university level, after the effect of COVID-19 will be measured in the coming years, uh, according to NYU Scott Galloway, who is an expert on uh, make or break universities, he foresees that between 10 and 30% of higher education institutions in the US will disappear in the coming years, in the next five to seven years. And the others will have to reimagine themselves. And to me, the key is the challenge of reimagining higher education in, uh, which is of course also an opportunity. In Cuba, given the scarcity of technological infrastructure, the island will paradoxically remain a, a space free from zoomification of everyday life. A challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Of course, the main challenge in Cuba is that with the ongoing economic reforms, Cuban institutions will have to be ever more self-reliant and uh, international collaboration will be ever more crucial for institutional survival. At the same time, the obligation to internationalize will produce more opportunities for academic exchange and it will be paramount to the, that the focus move beyond Havana to me in order to avoid excessive saturation in the capital city. In other words, Cuba is much more than La Habana uh, from now on, hopefully. A key problem to me that will likely remain is the country's inability to retain its best trained scholars. A partial way to stem highly qualified immigration would be to conceive higher education institutions as economic incubators leading to a higher level of imbrication between academia and the national economy. But of course, uh, the short term focus of economic reform in Cuba is mostly in terms of monetary reform. So that's still uh, not in the pipeline, I think, not for the immediate future. In terms of opportunities, I see them mostly as conceptual. Uh, it's the possibility of each country to reimagine the other through the lens, the self through the lens of the other. What the US can, turn, can take from Cuba, this I take from my own work and experience, is what I call the Eagle Turkey dialectic. Cuban faculty are all often forced to moonlight in non-academic activities. You might drive a car, rent a room, and this makes them uh, not only street smart, but vis-a-vis -vis their U.S. counterparts, it allows them to ground conceptual problems in very interesting ways. Ultimately, for example, getting to Hegelian ontology not only through the lens of epistemology, but through the lens of potatoes, i.e. not only high theory, but the experiential dimension. And this, to me and to my students, I notice along the years, is a key way to produce an alternative mode of knowledge.
which is extremely functional for the social sciences in particular. Another very important issue is uh, to become kind of more Cuban, meaning by that the official slogan, as we all know, is socialismo muerte, socialism or death, but the unofficial slogan whereby most people live is socialismo muerte, which means friendism or death, of course, but the idea is that beyond the normative framework of the nation, be it the allegiance to the market in the US or the Cuban revolution in La Habana, what matters is your ability to insert yourself in a multiplicity of different networks based on your race, gender, sexual identity, uh, hobbies, and political affiliations. That is a fundamental way also to produce knowledge and exchange. And another one I would like to highlight is there's a Cuban designer, Ernesto Rosa, who talks about the issue of technological disobedience. Cubans are trained, given the scarcity in the islands since the special period, to actively repurpose technology rather than being subjected to it, as is mostly the case in the US. If you have one of those and it breaks apart, you throw it away and you buy a new one. In Cuba, people will always refunction them. And the key issue for me is their ability to disrespect the preconceived authority of objects and give them new unthought of lives. Objects in Cuba are inherently potential because they can be re refunctioned and repurposed multiple times around. What Cuba can take from the US is crucial. Of course, it can take technological surplus. I, for example, will, I bring don tech donations every year to Casa de las Americas and other institutions. It can gain from increased free access to digital libraries and digital resources, uh, which is crucial in this uh, moment of economic crisis, increased academic exchange, leading to the internationalization of Cuban scholarship, the Biden administration will no longer probably deny visas to Cuban scholars going to Lhasa or to the Cuba program at Columbia University and broadly speaking more financial resources. And uh, the normative framework, I think the two most important things that Cuba needs from the US would be beyond the embargo, of course, which whenever will happen will happen, would be to eliminate the restrictions on financial transactions and eliminate restrictions on travel to and from Cuba. And I'll stop here. Gabriel, I know firsthand that you are very active in these academic exchanges. I, rem I remember that we met at Columbia University during an academic exchange, and we met for a second time in Havana during another exchange, and, and I have three questions in one for you. Can you please explain what do you do? How do you manage to keep doing these exchanges during the Trump administration? Mm -hmm. And what are your plans for the coming years? So I'll try to make, keep it short because I don't want to go over time. I'm Cuban and Italian. In Italian, there's a very famous saying, traduttore, traditore. The translator cannot do anything but betray the, mas the message in order to transmit it. In other words, what I do is, I firmly believe, cultural translation. I build bridges, I read one country through the lens of the other via a third country, which is Italy. Uh, I provide cultural translation. That's my job, that, as I see it in La Habana. Uh, beyond the program that you already mentioned, uh, which allows students to take classes with leading Cuban scholars to interact with grassroots organizations and develop their own research projects about their own specific topic of interest. I think what I do is I take Cuba as a, and I show Cuba, Cuba as a toolkit to through which, through which, sorry, people can actually interrogate their own uh, research agenda. How I managed to keep on going during the Trump administration, uh, leaning more back on my Cuban side vis-a-vis -vis bureaucracy, which means uh, never taking no at face value and always looking for creative ways around institutional blockages, be it in Cuba or in the US. And that has taught me a lot, believe me. It's, uh, it's a very beautiful challenge to mediate across bureaucracies mm -hmm. uh, in these two countries. And realizing also that fear is a great political force. Much of what Trump did, above all at the beginning, was to hollow out Obama's measures, but not to undo them. Several agreements of the Obama era have not been uh, eliminated. The embassy still stands. And several of Trump's measures can be undone by Biden through executive decree. The main driver, of course, uh, is students. Those who allow themselves to be permeable. Those who experience their own conceptual categories through a different lens. They come out of Cuba as more complex individuals. 
roughly 50% of my students go back to Cuba in their own terms after the IFP. And as a couple of my students wrote about their experience for a news outlet, I quote, the process of understanding this unique country is a constant exercise against the internal tendency of wanting to have only one firm and unwavering opinion about it, against its idealization and against its demonization. Or in the words of another one, Cuba changed me completely. That summer was more than an exchange program for me. It was unexpected, but deep. Ultimately, for me, Cuba is a tool for US students to embrace not only the diversity, but complexity. What I would say, the untweetable beauty of the real. My plans for the coming years, of course, is to keep on strengthening exchanges, uh, academic and beyond, beyond Cuba, between Cuba and third countries, including the US. Much of, us, uh, much of it, of course, will depend on the future of higher education. Uh, there's, of course, no going back to normal scenario. It's still unclear how many universities, including my own university, will be affected by COVID. Uh, for example, the course on the Havana Studio that you mentioned was suspended because of, financial, uh, of the financial crisis. I hope to be able to retake it. And uh, honestly, I hope to keep my job. And if not, reinvent myself uh, a la cubana through COVID-19. Keep on building bridges. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriel. Okay, according to the BBC, our next speaker was among the 100 most influential women in 2018. Ms. Alfonso, welcome to the Cuba program at Columbia University. And here is my first question. Despite all the conflict, culture has always been a bridge between Cuba and the US. What has been the role of the Lisa Alfonso Dance School in bringing both cultures together? And can you talk a little bit about your experiences during the period of normalization from 2014 to 2017? Please. Well, thank you to all of you for inviting me. My English is not very well looking or looking good, like say Celia Cruz, but I do my best. So if you think that I need to uh, be more specific or something, we can talk. It's easy for me. You support me. And thank you very much for that. So I think that our role in all this movie is... Uh, made and support the construction of the bridge step by step, day by day. So from 2001, we went in the United States in 2001 and until from last year, 2019, we moved all the time the, the ball between two countries. We went in the United States almost everywhere. We play in different theaters in Chicago, in New York. We went to the Grammys. We went to the city center with the whole company. And I say we are 32 people, young people. And at the same time, we receive in our building in, here in Havana, a lot of uh, people for, from everywhere, for all the world, but mostly from the United States. You know, any kind of people, all of them are always welcome. So at the end, we made the bridge and the really people to people because all the time we interchange experience, we interchange feelings and everything that we have like human beings because it's normal. So at the same time we work, when we go uh, to the United States to go, we go to the schools, uh, to the regular school, a secondary school, we go to dance the school, we work with a special programs with different kind of children with different kind of uh, disabilities and everything is all the time about talk, about relation, about how the culture can change things and don't talk about our difference. Talk about the same goal that we all have. There is the culture, the growth in the dimension of the feelings of people. And 
the most important thing I think that it's from for the young people, for the children and the young people, the family in general. This is what this is what we do from 2001. That is the first time until last year. And I don't know how many performance and how many interchange, how many moments we have to interchange with people in the United States and in Havana with people from the United States. Please, some Cuban artists from the island experienced reaction and even harassment in the last four years, especially in Florida. The cultural exchanges were partially interrupted in this period. And I wanted to know what was your experience in the past few years? Well, we don't have this kind of problem. We never have problems. Maybe because uh, our principal audience are not in Florida. You know, we go from Chicago to uh, New York to LA. So it's, it's not uh, the segment of the audience, even when we have a lot of people that love the company in Florida and at the same time a lot of former students from the company that, that now live in Florida or in different uh, cities in the United States. So I don't feel really over the company and over me this kind of problem. But I think that it's not it's something that is not good for anybody, you know. I think that we don't need this kind of problem. We don't need people against people, Cubans against Cubans or Americans against Cuba. I think that we need, that we do right now, everybody talk together in the same line. And maybe in some question, in some points, we are not uh, agree. And it's okay. You need to understand that. War is very boring is everybody think the same thing. So I think that the, the, our goals for the future, it's everybody together, try to broke this kind of uh, misunderstand between us. Because really, indeed, we are everybody Cubans. We are all Cubans. So we don't need, we don't need this kind of problem around or with us. And in the, in the first question you asked me is during this uh, Obama's period, uh, uh, we feel a, a different uh, scene. And yes, somehow, yes. Somehow during the Obama's uh, um, government, or I don't know how to say, uh, yes, we have a, like a, a little more open door, a little more freedom, for the interchange. And, uh, but in our experience, you know, we are focused all the time in work, work, very hard work, in order to have good results and a very high quality uh, dance company to uh, compete in any scenario around the world and in the United States and Canada, in order to be competitive or well, good enough to uh, stay in the, in the perf preference of the audience. And it's because of that we have a lot of audience in the United States. And every, every time we go back to the United States, it's because people love the company and people want, want to see the company. Yeah, Liz, if I may add, every, 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 every time that the U.S. and Cuba have, has, has, has attempt, have attempted to, to, to have closer ties, that has been preceded by a cultural exchange, very intense cultural exchange. So yes, apparently, all the time. Co apparently culture uh, it, it It's over. Together, yeah, it goes over politics. It's so, go over politics. Liz, your company played a key role in these cultural exchanges during the Obama presidency. Um, and the incoming Biden administration is expected to restore at least some of those policies. What are your expectations regarding uh, cultural exchanges for the coming years? You know, this is a very interesting question for me because I never expect nothing. I never expect uh, something. I, I just work. 
I say always to all my students, I have more than 1,000 students in, in 30 years. You can imagine the quantity of students that, that we have all, all those times. But I think that you need to be ready for the opportunity. And it's something that young people, it's difficult for them sometimes to understand. You need to be ready when the opportunity is come. And I hope that with the new administration, we can continue with our interchange more and more close and more and more open. And always, all uh, culture, sports, and science, I think that need to be always over all the problems that we can have. And in somehow, somehow, uh, we can change, we can change things. It's, it's, it's in our hands. Because from the beginning of my life, I remember all, all the time, the go on, go down with the relations between two countries. I remember part of my family is in, live in the United States and always is a problem from my grandmother to my mother to me. So I hope that we can give to our grandsons another uh, history, another movie, another picture about what it's happened between two countries because it's too many times. That's enough. That's enough. Thanks, Lisa. I'm sure that any new scenario will be will be preceded by by culture. So thanks for the work that you're doing. Uh, in April 2019, the Trump administration canceled a deal between the Major League Baseball and the Cuban Baseball Federation that would have allowed Cuban players to join professional teams in the U.S. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Tommy Goodman, and I would like to ask him because everyone knows that the love for baseball runs deeply within both the U.S. and the Cuban culture. Uh, Tommy, can you please start with a brief overview of the baseball ties between Cuba and the U.S.? Sure, and first, thank you very much, uh, Meg and Harold and, and the Columbia University for inviting me this evening. Uh, it's the baseball off season, so it's exciting to be able to talk about the sport even when it's not being played. Uh, but I've been played um, in both countries almost the exact same uh, length of time. Uh, both countries started playing uh, in the mid-19th century. Uh, basically, the first game in the United States was around 1846. The first game in Cuba was just a few years later, well, two decades later, but in the 1860s. And it was actually brought to Cuba, the story goes, by a group of students that studied at Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. And they brought the first glove, the first ball, the first bat down to Cuba, and the sport took off. Um, and the sports evolved on parallel but distinct paths in both countries. But the love for the game became really part of the DNA of both cultures. And uh, that sort of love evolved, um, as I said, parallel, but then also it intersected you know, throughout the decades, throughout the years. So even into the 19th century, you had the first American teams led by Major League Baseball players going down to Cuba. In the early 20th century, when players couldn't play in the United States. They went down to Cuba to play. Um, in 1947, Jackie Robinson, before he ever played in the United States, actually trained with the Dodgers spring training in Havana. Um, he had other teams playing uh, spring training throughout, throughout the mid 20th century in Cuba. In the 1950s, there was even an affiliated minor league baseball team called the Havana Sugar Kings that uh, where the Reds play team, they competed uh, for six years uh, in Cuba. So the ties are really deep. They go back a long, long way. And for both, for the people of both countries, that, that passion hasn't gone away. Um, after the 50s, you still had some interest of, of major league teams going down. Uh, of course, the famous came in 1999 uh, when the Baltimore Orioles went down to Cuba was a major icebreaker, a major milestone. And the Cuban national team came up to Baltimore and played against uh, the Orioles in the United States. Um, and then fast forward 15 years later during the detente with Obama, part of his trip, the culminating event was the game at Latin America in Cuba uh, against the Tampa Bay Rays and the Cuban national team. So 
it's it's very much become uh, part of the fabric of both cultures and for that reason i think uh is, is the perfect way to, to bring the people together and and to continue the legacy that really started around the same time over 150 years ago Thanks, Tommy. Um, the CVF's motto was to build bridges through a shared passion for baseball. Can you give us some examples of the initiatives that under your leadership, the foundation undertook to accomplish this? Like, which, initi which initiatives are you particularly proud of in terms of impact and in terms of demonstrating the aim of building bridges? Where do you find success out of Cuba? Well, again, it's to me, it's the ideal people to people activity. Um, it can, and anybody can really be what we call a baseball diplomat. Um, I used to always uh, make the suggestion to folks that travel down to Cuba that if you wear your favorite baseball hat, you're, you are guaranteed to have at least one friend if you just walk through all the man. Because there was somebody uh, on the streets that was either going to like your team or not like your team, but they would talk to you because it was baseball. So my favorite anecdote for me uh, before even, you know, starting with CEBF was, um, one of the first things I did when I went to Cuba for the first time was, was play a, a pickup baseball game. And it wasn't just with, um, with anyone, it was with some of the, uh, some of the best players that, that played about 20, 30 years ago as a game of softball. And I'm not a major baseball player, but um, I was welcomed and uh, it was a very, it was a very collegial environment and um, uh, it was a great way to sort of get to know uh, new friends just through the sport of baseball. So based on that sort of, principle, um, our, our activities were divided among three big categories. One was community building and sharing, one was education and exchange, and one was cultural preservation. And on the community building and sharing uh, front, we organized um, baseball trips uh, based um, on the people-to-people -people principle. And it wasn't just playing the game, though. It was using the game to open up conversations with folks from all walks of life. So we visited with memorabilia collectors, uh, historians, former players, um, youth players, uh, attended games, of course, but it was all based on this sort of this shared passion that, that we knew going in was going to bring people together. Um, part of that was small scale equipment donations where we visit you know, youth uh, practices and, and get baseballs or baseball cards and, and get to know the players. And then part of this was also uh, over the longer term hoping to do field rehabilitation. So um, visiting some of the fields, you know, throughout, throughout the island to see, you know, where with, with appropriate time, appropriate licenses, we can actually help rebuild some fields. Uh, the other was education and exchange. So we spoke uh, at conferences in Havana and in the United States on the importance of, of the topic. Uh, we helped to organize uh, a conference in SUNY Cortland at the Baseball Hall of Fame um, in New York, where we had uh, baseball stakeholders come up and talk about uh, different, different topics of mutual interest. And then Another was um, clinics. So actually doing youth clinics and training both coaches and players on, on best practices and also learning from our counterparts who of course were experts in their own right. And then the other category, cultural preservation was focusing more on, on big topics uh, where um, uh, it was maybe a longer term play, but still based on a shared passion where we could uh, bring people together. So a good example of this is, is uh, Hershey. It's a small town outside of Havana where Milton Hershey had his chocolate factory in the first half of the 20th century built a little town. And if you go there now, you'll see that the centerpiece of that town uh, was a baseball field. So one of our big projects was sort of uniting um, the town of Hershey, Pennsylvania with the town of, of Hershey, Cuba through baseball. And um, before COVID hit, we were on the cusp of actually bringing a youth team down from Hershey, Pennsylvania to play against the youth team in Hershey Cuba and highlight that shared history, but then just to have a, a friendly exchange and, and get to know one another. Another similar project was um, on the grounds of Kinko Hia, where Ernest Hemingway uh, had built a baseball diamond at his home um, outside of Havana. We were going to stage a game there too, a friendly game between uh, the youth teams from, from the town where Hemingway lived in the United States with where he lived in Cuba, again, just to, to open that uh, line of communication. Um, and finally, uh, Baseball Hall of Fame was a, a major priority of the Baseball Federation and something that we hope to form sort of a working group um, around to sort of share best practices and in the model of Think of Bahia, 
um, to create sort of this cultural icon to celebrate the, the past uh, baseball successes in Cuba by working together on this sort of um, people to people project uh, where we're sharing best practices. So it ranged from the grassroots all the way up to, to projects of, of larger scale and ambition, but still, again, based on this the shared love. Of the Thanks. Thanks, Tommy. Um, thanks to Gabriel, Liz, and, and Tommy. Now I'm going to give the floor to the audience. I just remind the audience that you can write your questions and comments on the chat box, and, and we're going to make sure that your questions are addressed in the program. So I would like to start with a question from Eva Luis. Eva Luis is a preliminary participant of the New School program on Cuba for 2021. So her question is for Professor Gabriel Vignoli. Uh, Eva Luis is asking if you see a change in the ideas of race and racism in Cuba with a higher access to internet. And if so, in what direction? Do you see a change because of the access to internet in Cuba on race and racism? Of course. Uh, yes, for sure. I would say that the pivotal moment predates the internet. Of course, it's a special period to make a comparison with another phenomenon, the idea of feminism. If you look at the, Feder uh, the Federation of Cuban Women, it was the organization that lifted up Cuban women from the top down, meaning by, meaning by that it was a, an organization that lifted up all Cuban women without, however, allowing for uh, difference to emerge. In the words of many Cuban scholars, uh, the Federation of Cuban Women was una organización femenina, pero no feminista. The idea of feminism emerges with the special period when the homogeneity of the new man of socialism comes to a halt and difference emerges. The same thing occurs with race, right? Racism and racial diversity comes, becomes much more apparent with the, the special period. In terms of digital access, certainly that makes it more uh makes it stronger in two ways uh it does provide more footage uh to the general population and i would say it allows for and that's tied also to this uh uh realm let's say it allows also for much more uh for a much more performative dimension mm -hmm. of race you have uh, a lot of uh bands Los Orichas and many more that uh, talk about the issue of race in a much more uh, thoughtful, provocative uh, way than they used to do before. And that is also thanks to the web for sure. Thanks, Gabriel. We also have a question here for, for yeah, we have a question for Tommy Goodman. Um, the question is, do you think that the mayor league contract will resume during the Biden administration? And does it have to wait until a second term of the Democratic administration? Like, the, this person is also asking if you can tell us something about how the negotiations happened. Well, the negotiations occurred over the course of two years. Um, they started under President Obama and it was concluded mm -hmm. under, under President Trump in December of 2018. Um, it doesn't require an act of Congress, so it was, uh, it was the original agreement was based on a, a license issued by the Department of Treasury, um, and then the Trump administration determined it was illegal because uh, the money was going to the Cuba, the wages that, the percentage of the wages that the Cuban players were uh, getting paid by salary was, was going, uh, was called post fee, so it was um, you know, close to a certain percentage, and that was paid to the Cuban Baseball Federation, which was determined to be Cuban government entity. So I think it's essential that, uh, and quite possible that the uh, Biden administration could uh, find a, a creative way to um, create a solution um, where the money doesn't necessarily go directly to the Federation. Um, but what's going on still with all these players that are, are leaving the island um, is very, um, it, it's a human rights violation. It's, uh, it puts the, the young people's lives at risk, and there has to be a way to end that and to have the players come up to the United States so that not only can you know we we save a lot of uh, heartache and, and trouble for them, but we get to enjoy their talent uh, at a maximum level. So 
uh, I, I hope that, that they can come up, that they can get uh, compensated for their play and enjoy their time. And I will say I was down in Cuba right after the agreement was announced, and, and there was an energy down there in the baseball space that I hadn't felt. Just go around and talk to some young people to hope uh, the, the excitement of having to leave your friends and, and family behind, and that uh, you know, could come up and, and, and really uh, play the game they love. So um, I think there's a, a possibility that that agreement could be revisited, um, but it won't require second term, and it will require. Thanks, Tommy. I, I think we have some issues with your audio, but definitely there, there are many people in Cuba and, and the U.S. waiting for, for this deal to resume as soon as the Biden administration takes over. So there's a lot of, lot of, of expectation. We hope reality uh, gets there. So we have another question. We have a question from uh, John McAuliffe. Hi, John. Uh, John has a comment. He says that the top priority for Americans is to engage with the Biden administration to demand the quick, quick restoration of Obama policies, including travel and fully functioning embassies and consulates. Um, and that the Cuban performance should also be allowed to collect professional fees in the US. Um, yeah, during the current, uh, during the loss of the embargo, many Cuban artists cannot do that. I'm gonna let the, 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 the panelists to, to answer this. Um, John is asking, Cuba and the U.S. sponsors should go beyond the LASA bubble. This is the more the academic sector. Maybe Gabriel can talk about this. He said that Cuban academics and professionals should go to a great variety of U.S. conference and invite American counterparts to attend theirs. So what do, what, what do you think about it, Gabriel? And um, also Tommy and Liz can join in. What can be done? I mean, I'll, I'll tackle one and three. Two, of course, is Liz's uh, Yes, of course, that should be a top priority, but I sadly believe it is not. The Biden administration has uh, many more relevant things for the American public in its own plate. I don't think, sadly for me, uh, that, and for us, that Cuba is a top priority. So I think it's gonna take a while, as I said before. For sure, it needs to go beyond the Laza bubble. There's no question about that. It, it's not a need. It, it's a necessity. It's much more than that. It's, it's something that it's unavoidable. Cuban institutions, if when the economic reform uh, enters into full effect, will not be able to function without external funds. As easy as that. Uh, that goes for all Cuban institutions. So they need external funding and they need more international scholarship for sure. And I, I am quite positive. I have been made aware by several counterparts, mostly outside of La Habana, that they want a exchange with academic universities. If you have a, a university that wants to uh, create a program with universities in Matanzas, Pinar del Rio, Cienfuegos, Olguin, shout out and I'll put you in touch with them. There's a lot of need for that, for sure. There's no question about that. Yeah, Liz, what do you think about John's comment that the Cuban performers, Cuban artists should be allowed to collect professional fees in the U.S., Liz? So at the beginning was, was hard because we only uh, can receive per diem. Then we have a little more flexibility and yes, it's, it's necessary because it's the way that it is and it's around the world. The artists and every worker need to uh, call it money for the for their job for their work so it's is the regular term it's normal and it's the way it's respect yeah we have more questions here um uh, timothy beckman is is uh, his comment has a comment here that he understands that there are huge monetary difference when tourists travel to cuba like in when travel restrictions are lifted um, and if they are lifted and possibly the embargo. Won't that increase outsider influence and money will have, uh, what kind of influence can that have in the Cuban government and on society as a whole? What kind of internal changes do you see with the total lifting of the embargo on the travel restrictions to, to Cuba? Uh, I'm, I'm putting this question for any of our panelists to, to answer. What kind of influence can the lift of the embargo and, 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 and the travel can have on Cuba? Hiroquita. Mm, 
I think I, I think that it's a like an it's a, like an explosion because if money start to to move, you know, Cubans generally we don't have a, a we always have challenge to for survive for to survive every day. So you can imagine if we have the instruments and the things that we need to do, what a lot of things we can to do. We, we, we do a lot of things, you know? Even when we don't have, I remember when we start, we don't have a pair of shoes on a, a pair of a, a zapatillas to, to dance. And even on, with this, Huge problem because we need things to dance to, to do our show. And we look, look the way to do it. We have like everybody around the world support from a lot of uh, friends, their families, but, but it's hard and we continue moving. So you can imagine if we don't have restriction, you can imagine you're Cubans, the imagination, you know, the scenery is totally changed. And a lot of things change if, if we conquer that, you know, is if the decision is to move in, moving forward. Thanks, Lee. I, if I may add, what I would like to add is, I'm not gonna talk about the embargo because it's, it's an unknown known, as Ron Paul would put it. Uh, what I certainly think it's, it would have been an option for regime change, and that's what uh, the Cuban elite feared under Obama to open up economic exchange much more. Uh, on the ground, talking to architects in the Havana Studio course that I have, they made a very stark comment. Gentrification, for example, is a force of evil in, in progressive New York City. But in La Habana, it might be the difference between a building standing or a collapsing. Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental way to look at gentrification through a different lens. And the other thing that may be important is in terms of uh, a different perception of consumption, right? Uh, in the US, it's a lot of it is about conspicuous consumption. In Cuba, a lot of it is also about vicarious consumption. Some pe people that don't have the means go to the TRD, the mall, to get fresh air and to look for products that they cannot purchase. Another way to put it is that uh, if you go to a Dwayne Reed, you will see in New York City or in the US, you'll see how products are fighting for shelf space. Whereas in Cuba, it is shelf space that is fighting for products. So of course, an influx of money will dramatically change the perception of the relationship between the individual and consumption in a dramatic fashion. But that has already occurred under Obama in part. A new wave of it will not have the same disruptive effect that it would, would have had if the Obama Entente would have been kept and allowed to grow stronger. I agree, and I'll just add, I think, you know, to your point, um, Gabriel, it's not, you wouldn't be starting from scratch, so there has been some advance already. There's been countless uh, b and that were developed, uh, private restaurants that Developed so all of that has will just accelerate, and I think that people will see benefit, especially with uh, the appetite for Americans to travel down there, is, is not going to go away any, anytime soon. And if there's no restrictions in terms of where they can go or what they can do, I think that people just see benefit in terms of um, the activities and the businesses that they'll stand up. Just to make sure, my students were not stopped by the Trump administration to go back on their own terms outside of my academic program. They were stopped by COVID, but not by Trump. Wow. So we went last year. <laughs> okay, we have another question. We, um, Luis Carlos Batista, a colleague from North America, is asking, is asking, in the last decades, sports, cultural, and academic exchanges have been dominated by partisan politics. Republican administrations favor less exchanges than the Democratic administrations. How is it possible to have a stable policy regarding these exchanges without the interference of U.S. domestic politics? How can we have a normal exchange without domestic politics interfering on this? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> I 
Well, I think from a baseball perspective or sporting perspective, so much depends on obviously on, on travel. Um, so unless and until we can make you know more digital activities, baseball related or sports related, we're gonna have to be on the ground. And one of the first things to go when the politics uh, take hold is you know the ability to, to get onto the ground. And so um, in terms of the baseball changes, that's that's one big thing. Um, and the same for for Cubans traveling north, right? We would need to again, put a consular section in the embassy so that if, for example, the Cuban um, Little League team, which is now eligible to compete in the Little League World Series, um, which I didn't mention, but is a significant milestone that was achieved about 18 months ago, well, it's going to be a lot easier if those kids can just go to the embassy in Havana to, to, to come up more. So um, making sure that, you know, the travel and the visa issuance um, procedures aren't affected as much, um, and certainly you know, reinstituting and trying to make as permanent as possible some of those basic general license um, uh, abilities uh, with travel and, and, and other sort of even to perform athletic uh, exhibitions, which is now uh, not, not possible without a specific license, but to sort of reinstate those and try to make it permanent and show that they're not political and that it's just, uh, you know, connecting people. I think it would be very important and hopefully insulated from, from further political turmoil. Thanks, Tommy. We have a we have a question from Gretchen. Gretchen is asking, like, exchange is also based on support, and Gretchen wants to know about the supplies that are necessary in Cuba in terms of art supplies, for example. I think this is this is for Liz. Um, has the Liz Alfonso has Liz Alfonso received supplies or donations from the U.S.? How does your dance uh, company survive in terms of supplies? Well, I think that it's like like every company in the world. We have our uh, own um, raising funds for the company, uh, and we, uh, you know, in the tours and during all the year, we take money and and uh, um, have the money just to buy the things that we need, and we buy the things around the world. You know, fabrics. Uh, shoes, everything, everything that we need for for perform, and from United States, yes, we receive a lot of support from the United States. We receive support from uh, people, you know, people that love the company and support the company, and we receive support from uh, organizations and foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, like the New Victory, the Forty Second Street. So we receive these different kinds of, of support from the United States and donations, not only, uh, you know, sometimes money and sometimes the things that we need to make the costumes, to, fa to for everything. So it's, it's normal, it's like everywhere. A little more difficult because of the uh, uh, costume law, las, las leyes de la aduana. Costume restrictions, but even even in the worst scenario, people come in their suitcase and bring things to all of us. So we receive a lot of support all the time, permanently, permanently. Thanks, Liz. We have a question from Yasmin Portales. Uh, hi, Yasmin. She's asking Tommy Goodman, are the Cuban and U.S. baseball leagues really compatible? He's thinking about season timing, the rules regarding pres prescription drug consumption, maximum time pitching or baiting, the economic power of the U.S. baseball organization, who made the players prefer to follow U.S. rules. Like, what would you say to Cuban fans afraid of losing the best players because of this? Mm. Well, it's a good question. Um, I think they're certainly compatible. I think the seasons can also overlap. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, at one point there was a, a minor league team um, in Havana, and there's no reason why uh, we can't have that again. Um, and that way you could have baseball year-round in Cuba because um, uh, until recently even the, the seasons, actually still to an extent, they don't overlap. So uh, the, the Cuban baseball season is starting in August and, and ending in, in January where the U.S. in a non-COVID season, it starts um, April and ends in October. So, uh, you can have more baseball, not, not less. And I think um, that's what is sort of beautiful about the connection because 
Um, if you have more conversation around the game, you can share best practices, you can, you can cooperate, you can plan, you can coordinate. It doesn't have to be um, uh, you're losing players that can't come back for a certain number of years or can't play for the Cuban national team. Instead, there's a, a flow of people back and forth. And with that flow of people is flow of ideas and flow of, of, of best practices when it comes to, to sharing the game. So I think um, that's why I think it's sort of the perfect icebreaker because there's so many ways that you, know, you can build uh, cooperation uh, around and, and in the game. Thanks, Tommy. Um, I have another, I have a question myself for, for you. I, I was trying to save it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. And this goes for the three of you. What steps could be taken tomorrow by the Biden administration to, 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 to normalize the exchange between the U.S. and Cuba? What could be done in sports? Like what doesn't need uh, Congress approval or something like that? What could be done by the president tomorrow to restore the exchanges that we had before? in sports, in culture, in academics? What are the priorities? <laughs> Just, you know, on a basic level with sports, it's uh, reinstituting a, either the general license for people to people travel or the, the general license to travel um, uh, under the guise of uh, athletic competition, which at this point you can't do. So um, that would enable, you know, little league teams to go back down without having to apply for specific license. And then secondarily, um, make it easier for Cubans, and as I mentioned, in Havana to get a visa to travel up to the United States um, for similar competitions. I think that's when you start to have a flow of players, especially youth players, um, in the game. And then on the people-to-people -people front, again, you can start to uh, organize those types of trips where you know, the, the American people are engaging with the Cuban people, learning about, about each other through, through baseball, something that we had done so we did that. You wouldn't need conventional approval. They could do that relatively early. Please. Yes, reopen the 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 embassy. It's a, it's fundamental because it's it's very complicated now. You know, last time we went in the United States was last year as an invitation from a Dolly Parton. We made like, I don't know, 76 performance, something like huge. But we need to go with the whole company to make, from Havana to Mexico. And then wait for the visas and then come back to Havana <clears throat> and go to uh, the season with, with Dolly. So it, 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 it's just because she's, she's um, an amazing uh, human being and a great artist that everybody respect and because we are a, a very good company but it's it's so hard but we never re, re, uh, we never accept uh, a no as an answer it's like uh, Gabriel students we continue moving so I think that the the principal one of the principal scene is reopen the 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 embassy and then, yes, I said the people to people as one of the best way to keep the friendship and the really love between the two countries. Nobody can change that because we, we respect one uh, each other and, and we love. It's really, you can walk in Havana or in Olguin or in Camagüey and everybody say, hello, how are you? You know what, we are very open. And, and it's easy. So no, it's not about politics. It's not about a party, a, a political party. It's political party. pure political party. It's about a humans in relationship in a very good one through the years, through the story. Thanks, Liz. Uh, sorry, Gabriel, I think I interrupted you before. No worries, I'll be brief. Of course, agreeing with Liz and Tommy visa issues, reopening the embassy. So the bureaucratic channels need to be reopened, uh, opening up travel to uh, other Cuban cities except beyond La Habana is fundamental for strengthening of academic exchange outside of La Habana and remittances. Those are three things that can be done very quickly and easily. 
uh, and that should be done very quickly and easily. Thank you. Uh, Tommy, we have a question here, I think is definitely is for you. Through which ways the baseball teams in Cuba have received or can receive in the future donations or supplies from the United States? Mm. I can't speak to the future. I can speak to the present um, and what the current U.S. administration um, is prohibiting, and that's, you know, donations basically to any government-affiliated entity. It's, made, it's a bit, become a lot more challenging to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, when we, as I said, when we took our, our small people, people trips down, we tried to take small-scale gear to, to kids. Um, and, and, and whether and how like the, the teams in the Cuban League can get their gear, um, something uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't deal with. But um, I do know in terms of the survival of baseball on the island, um, and that was uh, one of the other challenges I wanted to mention, right? Because um, even though baseball has 150 years in Cuba, um, just in the time that we were doing our work, we, we saw other challenges arising, right? Soccer is being played a, a lot more than it used to be down there. And that's a lot to do with the gear because it's a lot easier to, to just grab a, a friend and a soccer ball and, and kick it around than having to find all of the gear, find all of the space and find more friends to play baseball. So um, it is an, an issue and it's something that I hope with time um, and with changes in our own regulations, uh, we, can, we can solve um, because I think it will help um, morale when it comes to baseball in Cuba and certainly it'll help a lot more people to be able to play. Thank you, Tommy. Um, we have a question for Gabriel. Gabriel, how many academic institutions kept their Cuba-U.S. exchange programs during the Trump administration? Do you, do you know how, how much the Trump administration affected the institutions on the work in Cuba? I know it affected several institutions. I do not know the number. But what I do know is that uh, what has been key, uh, speaking to colleagues that run Cuba uh, abroad programs, has been the will and the determination of the people in the institutions. As I mentioned before, not to be scared and to act the Cuban way and try to find, uh, not to accept a no for an answer until, until the door is really shut. But I don't know the number. Maybe Mac knows, but I don't know. Mac, can you jump in and give your advice on this? Um, prior to the Trump administration, um, the University of Havana alone had approximately 300 exchange programs. Uh, after the Trump administration um, introduced restrictions in terms of travel, in terms of collaborative research programs, et cetera, um, the number of exchange programs at the University of Havana went from over 300 down to 13. Uh, every single um, institution of higher learning in Cuba experience the same type of reduction. Um, they did not have the same number of exchange programs, um, but they all experienced a tremendous decline uh, because of the restrictions that were imposed um, by the um, Trump administration. And part of the problem uh, does not come from the U.S. Embassy in Havana, but rather it comes from the fact that the Trump administration via the State Department basically shut down the operations of the consulate, which is the agency that provides um, visas and other um, legal documents for such exchanges to be done. Um, they reduce the staff at the consulates. The state, U.S. State Department, at the direction of the White House, reduce the number of people in the U.S. consulate in Havana to one. And you can imagine that one person cannot um, basically do uh, much of anything other than 
to deal with people who had humanitarian reasons for traveling either to the United States or back from the United States. Thanks, Mac. Um, there is a common fear between, between many Cubans in the island that the previous interest in Cuba was a fetish that will not be repeated a second time, that there will not be a second uh, uh, exchange that it, like it was from 2014 to 2017. Uh, is this the case? I would like to know your opinion in, in, in sports, in culture and academics. Is, is this the case? It was just a fetish from the past? I don't, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, maybe it was, it was two steps forward, one step back. But again, you're not starting from scratch. And um, I know a lot of people that are still very interested. Maybe uh, on the business front, there may be uh, more trepidation given um, what's happened over the last four years with some of the, the licenses like with Marriott and others that committed to the market and then couldn't see their business come to fruition um, or, or stay, uh, in, stay in business. Um, but I think uh, there may not be the immediate tsunami that we saw once, once folks could go down there, but I think there'll be a gradual warming and um, at some point perception becomes very healthy, I think over time, um, once the perception is improved and, and relations improved, then I think more people will, will want to go down again. And it may be a good thing that it's not going to be this tsunami all of a sudden. It'll be more this, this gradual, um, slowly but surely engagement that'll, that'll improve lives and, and it'll um, maintain a constant flow of, of, of interest. Please, Claudio. Day by day, things will be better. It's normal. And it happened. Just, we need just a little uh, time off, you know? Things can, can run because it's difficult. It's difficult. But I think that everybody have the intention and the good feel to, to move forward. I think so. Obama was a very good uh, experience and maybe we take from this point and go to the future, move, move forward. It's what we need, everybody needs that. In terms of academic exchange, I think the interest is higher today than it was a few years ago. Our program as of today has more applicants than normally. Uh, and that's starting even taking into account the fact that we don't know yet if it's going to be in person or online because of COVID. So there are many students that are even happy to zoom in uh, for the program, right? And uh, in particular, if you think about what I refer to as the identity crisis of the country in this country today, there are many people that are also thinking about what may be a different meaning of socialism vis-a-vis -vis the one that is given by the media in the U.S. and they want to experience it above all at the university mm -hmm. level. If you're talking about 20-year-olds who want to change the world, of course socialism will be high on their agenda to understand it and experience it. Mm -hmm. Just to add on the baseball front, I think just this past season you saw Jose Abreu as the American League MVP, you had a Rosarena who is the World Series hero, that got people thinking again about Cuba from a baseball perspective, wanting to know more about their history, where they come from, and, and they were you know, talking publicly about, about their experiences. And so that's one thing. I think that's not going away in terms of the, the Cuban players, and then we'll be having significant success with Charles attention on their, on their play. And then I mentioned earlier the Little League World Series. Um, it's likely Cuba will be up in, in Williamsport in 2022. So again, that'll draw attention to, uh, to the, the common bond of baseball, and, and I think that'll increase interest in, in further exchange. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's another question. Um, what is your experience with the Cuban institutions? Uh, to what extent has the political and, 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 and the other institutions in Cuba been interested in sports, academic, and, you know, and, and all those changes in, between Cuba and the U.S.? What is your experience with that? From a baseball perspective, I think the atmospherics, uh, the shift from Obama to Trump certainly 
I say about programming and, and the receptiveness of some of it um, on the island for our counterparts, I just did. Um, I think um, inevitably um, the, the MOPs, you know, interactions with, with the Federation also affected us too, because that was just the tone at the top, because we sort of had to follow their, their lead in a lot of ways. And once that deal was, was scuttled, um, the, the level of mistrust kind of Thanks, Tommy. Um, there is a question from, from Luis Carlos Batista. Luis Carlos is asking, what steps can be taken to include Cuban nationals as recipients of academic scholarships, such as the Fulbright Scholarship for Foreign Students Program? Uh, Gabriel, I think this goes to you. I think I'll defer that to Meg, if Meg is okay, because I'm sure she knows more than I do in that front. Okay. Um, the U.S. government during the Trump, uh, the, excuse me, Obama administration engaged in conversations with the Cuban government about um, opening up not just the Fulbright program, which is funded by the U.S., as well as foreign countries, um, and the uh, technicalities, if you will, um, of such exchanges uh, were never able to be fully resolved, although some progress was made. There were a number of other U.S. government-funded um, programs, interestingly enough, that did survive uh, the bureaucracy, if you will. Um, there were uh, programs that were specifically for teachers, um, primarily at the um, primary level and the secondary level, um, that were allowed Cuban um, teachers to come to the United States and to take courses in specific areas, for example, uh, teaching English as a second language. Um, there were also programs that were regarded um, as, during the Obama administration, as being the exchange of technical, law, uh, law, oops, technical knowledge of um, certain kinds. For example, there was a program at Stanford University where Cubans uh, receive scholarships to come for summer um, sessions on, um, in the areas of business administration, business management, and things of that nature. So actually, during the Obama administration, you did have a number of um, successful programs and many universities uh, there was very strong interest. The Institute of International Education, which works worldwide, had over 4,000 U.S. institutions, not just universities, but also, for example, um, associations of medical professionals, legal uh, associations, et cetera, that were interested in having academic exchanges Columbia University, for example, um, has sent down, beginning in the Obama administration, uh, but continuing even into the beginning of the Trump administration, uh, it sent down um, law professors who gave seminars um, over time on the U.S. legal system, for example, as well as some aspects of the international system. So there was a flowering during the Obama administration of academic exchanges of all sorts, the most common being those uh, exchanges primarily of U.S. students going to Cuba. Um, the Cuban uh, participants in U.S. academic programs in the United States were primarily people who were either professors themselves or in graduate programs or very specialized programs. And I'll finish by saying that um, many universities in the United States uh, during the course of the Obama administration 
did establish programs in specific areas uh, where they had strengths, including, for example, um, tropical ag agriculture and water resources and things of that nature, environmental studies. Some of those continue, and there are, and maybe Harold and Luis Carlos can uh, check me on this. There are about a little under 200 graduate students from Cuba continuing to do master's degrees or um, doctoral degrees or master's in law or advanced studies in medicine, et cetera. And there is um, one particularly successful program and that is the um, Cancer Research Institute based in Buffalo continues to have a good connection with the Cuban Immunological Institute where they're working together, particularly on a vaccine uh, for cancer patients, which has been going on now for about 10 years and continues. Thank you, Meg. We have, a, we have two more questions. Um, first question is for Liz. Liz, do you know if it exists a goodwill in the Cuban Ministry of Culture to allow Cuban dancers to receive training in dance companies in the US? What is the opinion of the, of the institutions in Cuba, the, Cuban, the Minister of Culture in Cuba? It happens. It happens, not only in the United States, it's around the world. It's happened everywhere, all the time. It's normal. It's normal. It happened. And even sometimes the same, you know, the director of the schools or the company come to Cuba and look, because we have excellent dancers. Everybody say, everybody talk about the first the inv invasion, the invasion, invasion, the Russian uh, invasion of dancers in the United States and then the Cuban, because it was. And we have, you know, Jose Manuel Carreño at the uh, American Ballet Theater, ABT, Xiomara Reyes at the ABT, and I don't know how many, a lot of uh, students, dancers, professional dancers, and professors, professors everywhere. Right now, I think in Caridad Martinez that did with the, with the Harlem Ballet, with the LA School, so we have a lot of people outside working in a very good way. So it's possible. It's possible. And I don't know if, you know, if the Minister of Culture, I think that it's a decision of each person. And just, you do it. You can do it. That's, that's good to know that there are no institutional limitations to do it. So no. That, that's great for the, for the coming years with the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. So I, I have one more question, one final question. It's not necessarily related to the U.S., but we like to indulge our, our, our audience when they ask questions. Uh, Ezekiel is asking that Cuba finds itself as a hub for practitioners of indigenous West African faith. Um, can any of you, and I think I'm going to include Professor Crahan in this question because I know she's an expert on religion. So can you speculate about Cuba's role in the race to establish relationships with Africa in respect to religion and beyond? Gabriel, Mac, Tommy, Liz. <laughs> Gabriel. Okay, I'll start, but you'll please correct me. Please correct me. So, to me, there's a few things that are crucial about uh, religion in Cuba. Number one, of course, is syncretism. Uh, you may find many people that are paleros, babalaos. So you have Ifa and Palo. You have religion from West Africa, uh, from today's Nigeria, let's say, Yoruba tradition, the one that throws carry shells to forecast the future, and from the Congo the ones that do like voodoo, black magic, or rather uh, religion to affect the present, right? That is a, a, a primordial link to uh, the other part, the, the West Coast of Africa. Many African religious figures have come to Cuba, as far as I know, and found a more pure 
language and more pure religious rituals in Cuba because they're quote unquote kind of frozen in time from the 16th and 17th centuries. So that's a very interesting take. The fundamental thing of course is that on the one hand they're pure, on the other hand they're hybrid because you have the imbrication of religious, uh, of Christianity, Catholicism, uh, Santeria and Palo. For example, uh, a very important date in Cuba-U.S. relations, of course, it's December 17th, 2014, which on the U.S. side means very little, but on the Cuban side is the day of Babalu Ye, Siete Rayos, or San Lázaro. So the same religious figure, which is the image of resurrection, is Christian, is Catholic, sorry, from Palo, I'm from Santeria, I'm from the Regla de Fa. So you have this syncretic views, which is fundamental and permeates the island. Of course, the other connection to Africa, it's more political, it's Che Guevara's and it's their world, it's the, the tri tricontinental Cuba's uh, operation in South Africa, Ethiopia and Angola, but that's a different story. In terms of religion, I'll stop there and I will humbly defer to Matt <laughs> Well, before the Obama administration, there were linkages between uh, the spiritist religions in Cuba and people in the United States who are interested in um, being, uh, becoming adeptos, uh, becoming introduced, uh, initiated into the various uh, spiritist religions uh, that Harold and Gabriel refer refer referred to. Um, and this was important because there was, even as I said before Obama, there was a regular flow of people from the United States who went to Cuba and studied the religions there and were in many instances inducted into um, the spiritist religions and even became santeros uh, or leaders and then came back to the United States and spread those particular spiritist religions in the United States. And uh, this increased, obviously, interest in the West African um, religions. And you began to get a triangular um, circuit, if you will, of some people who went to Africa from the United States and became interested. And then for the reasons that Gabrielle mentioned, went to Cuba then to obtain more knowledge of the various expressions, different expressions of spiritist religion. And then there were others who were introduced to the spiritist religions in New York, but then went to Cuba and from Cuba to Africa so there was a very definite um, substantial flow of people more or less um, going in a triangular fashion new york africa cuba or new york or other parts of the united states new york not being the only center of spiritist religions in the united states but going from new york to havana or to other areas within cuba then to africa and then back and um, it really goes back to the initial core of this discussion, and that is what is the benefit of exchanges and the degree to which understanding of Cuba in general um, that was added to in the United States, for example, as well as understanding of various countries in Africa was tremendously increased by this type of interchange that was going on, not just U.S. Cuba, but also U.S. Cuba, Africa, et cetera. Um, and I'd like to emphasize one thing, and that is even with all of the restrictions imposed by the Trump administration, um, there were a fair number of exchange programs uh, that continued um, during the Trump administration, particularly in the academic and the scientific and to a lesser degree in the cultural realms. And I'd like to mention just one 
Columbia University in 2019 sent a team of 14 uh, architects and preservationists and environmentalists to Cuba um, to help suggest ways that a historic building in Old Havana that is being transformed into an environmental study center could be greened, could be made more efficient in terms of water, uh, heating and cooling, et cetera. And um, I can name a good two dozen other universities that kept such programs going on. So it wasn't a total whiteout. So there are programs in existence um, that can be um, expanded and developed more. And particularly in the medical realm uh, with the demands and the challenges of COVID, the cooperation between um, the researchers, not only in the United States, but in Europe and elsewhere, um, and the Cuban research is, is going to be very important going forward. And let's hope that the Biden administration, even though it's not one of their top priorities, Cuba is not one of their top priorities, but there are certain areas where um, a lot of time could be saved uh, by reanimating um, or revitalizing some of the programs, the medical programs, and the academic and the cultural, as well as the sports programs, et cetera. They haven't disappeared entirely. Thank you, Matt. Um, just to finish, uh, John McAuliffe is, is, is saying a very interesting comment that one problem that has to be addressed to have large scale exchange students coming to the United States is making it impossible for them to qualify to overstay visas under the Cuban Adjustment Act. The Cuban Adjustment Act makes it uh, very easy for, for exchange students to stay in the U.S. Um, some institutions will hesitate to sponsor, and um, the U.S. consulate will also not give visas if it's so easy to overstay. So that's a legal issue that should also be addressed yeah. in the future. Yeah? And okay. two manos. Okay, so I think we covered all the questions, and I think we are ready to finish. Um, I, I would like to say that I'm amazed about the quality of the of the internet in Havana right now with Liz. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had to say, it. very good internet. So, thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, thanks to the panel of experts for your time and your insights. Thanks to the institutions that, sp that sponsor us, and especially to Professor Margaret Crahan. It was a pleasure joining, joining all of you today. We say goodbye until the next webinar. Please stay healthy and see you the next semester. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks to Harold and Gretchen for pulling this together. <laughs> Team effort, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much.